Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good night. Wherever you are in the world, we're here in Israel. It's 8 a.m. And I'm really happy to be here with Tomer and Nirit. And Yom Saika will also join us. Um, our panel is the state of the future of work in the Middle East. And I just wanted to say how incredible this whole conference is that Enrique put together. And each time he takes it up a level, now there's also all these breakout rooms and people having these important discussions about how to organize ourselves for the future, which is really, really important discussions that need to be had. I just want to repeat some of Enrique's welcoming remarks about acceleration. Uh, he said, you know, from Thomas Friedman's book, there's acceleration of climate change, of technology, there's this demographic shift. He said how it's critical for us to understand how these major forces are impacting our work how organizations can get ready for this new reality. What got us here should not prevent us getting to the next stage. We need to embrace a new mindset and new ideas. Hi, Saika. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. To be able to fulfill the promise of HR in becoming a trailblazer in leading organizations successfully into this new reality of work. Then Enrique gave this tangible example that we all have right now of the coronavirus, how it's caught catching us off guard. Viruses have spread before, but now our world is so globalized and interconnected, viruses can't be contained in a specific region. So this platform that he created is helping HR understand these accelerations and prepare for them. And none of this is worth anything, he said, if we don't have the mental flexibility we need to learn and change, the mental flexibility. So what we do in these sessions, we're actually exercising. He's pushing us all to exercise this muscle of, you know, of, of learning and changing, which is not easy, but, but thank God uh, Enrique is pushing us all to do this. So now Saika has joined us, and now you're each going to have a minute to introduce yourselves, please. Who wants to start? Nimit? Okay. Good morning, everyone. So excited to see everyone from all over the world. And, and Rika, so thank you so much, Enrico, for setting this up. I've um, been thinking about all the conferences in the world that are getting canceled because of uh, travel restrictions and the virus. And here we are with the future of work in an absolutely future format uh, conference. So thank you for that. I am Marie Cohen, and I'm based in Israel. Um, and uh, I specialize in the future of work and its implications uh, from a human resources perspective. So on people and careers, organizations, management, and the various uh, life cycle, employee life cycle structures. And I also work a lot with policymakers and educators on changing the infrastructure you need so that all this will come together successfully. Thanks for having me. Tamir? So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Simon. I'm from Microsoft, the National Technology Office. Uh, also, for the last uh, four years, I've been, uh, like Nerit, uh, dealing with the future of work, especially from the automation part, the technology part. Uh, I was the futurist of Amdocs for the last uh, three years before joining uh, Microsoft. And I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy for this uh, conference. And the Middle East is a huge entity from Mauritania till Afghanistan. And uh, as Okay, you got it there at the end. Saika, go ahead. Hello, my name is Saika Bennett and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Searchy. And we are looking to help reduce the bias that exists in the workplace and leverage the fourth industrial revolution, which really is demonstrating new ways of working all around the world. So I was never in love with AI. I was actually a people person. I thought this will never touch human resources. And I eat my words because I was actually ignorant <laughs> the huge benefits of technology. And um, what's fascinated is it's actually making us more human than ever um, and giving really us the right tools to be able to connect on a global level. I mean, look at this conference, for example. How else would we be able to do this? Um, without having to physically travel to a location. So technical, technology is beautiful if utilized and understood mm -hmm. in the right way. Um, and the impact on humanity is really um, what I'm about. And a job is more than just a job, it's actually a lifeline. So how do we get this lifeline out there to as many people um, around the world and make sure that you know, we create happier, high-performing teams? 
Amazing, Saika. And uh, you mentioned the whole human thing. We, it, it, this whole process is causing us to become more human. It's, it's ironic because we're all worried about the future of work and the robots and everything. And now we're digging deep into what makes us so human. And, and actually, you can't do anything in business, in the business world today, without dealing between this connection between business and people. And it, it, there's the social aspects of business, and that comes to recruiting people, the people, the company culture. It's all connected now. You can't separate social things from business things. So um, we really have all these new conditions, like I said, Enrique was talking about, all these shifting dynamics. And the thing is, how are we going to suit ourselves to these new processes that are shifting? All these things are shifting in the world. So it's amazing that we have this opportunity to discuss because, you know, new ideas, that's where new ideas are born from, from humans sharing their thoughts, their opinions. And that's what we're going to do in this discussion. And let's see what's going to be born from this discussion and from this whole global conference that America has organized. So we have four questions that I sent you in the email. You know what I'm going to ask you, and we're going to have just an open, free discussion. And what we're really dealing with is the future organization, organizational business structure. How are we going to set things up? And let's dream big. Let's, let's get to some new, some new insights, new ideas. The world needs a whole new way of thinking and doing things. So the first question is, please give us your take on the situation in the Middle East and the world, current and future trends. Who wants to start? I don't mind starting if you need someone to jump in. <laughs> um, so the current trends that we're seeing in the Middle East are very exciting. I've been here for about eight years, um, never seen anything like this. We're, I think the uh, dynamic um, transformation that's that happening um, when it comes to digital and people um, is phenomenal. So I think it's almost like there's, there's a huge influx of, uh, there always has been a huge influx of expats, definitely, where I live. But I think governments are starting to realise the extreme value of the next generation, right? So when we look at the youth, that we look at um, what they um, can contribute in, in, in terms of ways of working, the way things have been is not an option anymore. Right. The future is, 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 we used to talk about the future like it was five, ten years away. Um, the future was like yesterday. <laughs> you know, it's, we have to bring our people in line. So I think the Middle East is definitely seeing, uh, the governments are definitely leading the way. And if you look at the big visions that they have set at the top to say by 2030, for example, we want X, Y, and Z. We want to be paperless. We want to be digital. We want AI to be a big part of, of, of the solutions that we have here. This then changes everything underneath that. And um, I remember comparing this region to someone, I spoke to someone from IBM in the US, and I said, how are things in New York? And he said, you're actually lucky in the Middle East because your government is setting the strategy. They are like entrepreneurs. And then it's a lot easier underneath that to then bring the, uh, the talents, the people, the ideas. It's very difficult to go from the bottom up if, if you don't have the buy-in from, um, from the top level. So I think we have a, a beautiful chaos, <laughs> which is a chaotic situation has led us into now uh, playing catch up and trying to accelerate um, uh, our, our goals here right, as, as, a, as the various countries in the region. Yeah, this is very interesting in, in some of the, the conversations we had um, and in the region, we don't often talk as a region. So this has been a wonderful opportunity and it was surprising to us to hear this perspective that, um, that in some areas the governments are leading the way. I think in Israel we uh, we feel a lot more like New York. So it's it's the reverse, right? It, the, the innovation is coming from the bottom down, from the bottom up. Um, so we are seeing, I think, the wonderful opportunity of, of um, location not being such an issue as it used to be, right? So you don't have to be uh, where the world considers the centers of power or of economics or of innovation to actually create innovation and become a center yourself. So in that respect, um, people from all over the region can just be what they, you know, can be. And I think 
I've been reading about you. Your example is fascinating, um, and uh, and and your um, your company is is exciting and absolutely the way to go. So thank you for doing that. Um, and and I think that um, we see it's a good example of in some places you see countries um, setting setting the way from the top and in other places. And I think Israel is an example. We actually see the 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 work being done from the bottom. Uh, but whatever it is, uh, once technology gives people the ability to do uh, whatever they can, regardless of where they are, then we're starting to see a really interesting um, people being able to bring them, their whole selves to the world and, and, and to innovation and not so much limited by location and country and geo and other topics. So... <laughs> I'll be happy to just zoom out a bit and see what's going on in the world because everyone is talking about the fourth industrial revolution uh, started five, six years ago. And uh, we can see that this digital transformation, the, the business strategy is driven by governments all around the world. The US, Russia, China are leading, but uh, as even Thomas Friedman said, the AI is changing everything. And uh, the book, uh, Thank You For Being Late, is his journey to learn what is going on around the world. But you can see that uh, AI is really driving everything. And we have already 28 countries uh, that created or published an AI national strategy. Israel is also working on its uh, strategy. But if you look at the entire Middle East all, almost, for the last three years or so, uh, Tunisia has released uh, her, their smart Tunisia strategy, Saudi Arabia, uh, you have it in the UAE, Gulf countries, and now Bahrain also. And even three weeks ago, Iran uh, started working on their digital strategy to see how it can transform uh, the things that are uh, being done. Mostly it's uh, driven by uh, top-down because the investment needed uh, to drive AI and automation and quantum computing uh, is uh, should be funded uh, by uh, the government because no private organization has the necessary funds. So you can see this amazing top-down verticals, even Egypt. Also in our Egypt, country? Uh, also in our country? In Israel? So Israel, we have two committees that are, uh, during these days, are uh, convening. One is the INQI, the Israel National Quantum Initiative, and also the AI National Committee. Uh, they got, they received billions of uh, shekels. It's uh, many hundreds of millions of dollars for the next three to four years. Uh, From the to government? Drive from the government, yeah. Um, so this is something that we need to understand. It's a necessity. And also the Israeli Innovation Authority just uh, two months ago also released a new program to train more data scientists because we are this resource, a data scientist, the person or the occupation that drives the implementation of AI uh, is a scarce resource in Israel. And they created a, a unique program to train and upskill uh, more data scientists. So you can see it all around the world. And even Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, said two years ago, AI is the future. And whoever rules AI will rule the world. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, the next question we're going to talk about, we talked about current trends. The next question is things that we currently have that we're happy with and we want to maintain. I think the diversity, if I look at uh, the, the world is different depending on what countries you go to, right? So the governments have st set strategies, but each country will have either an aging population or a youth population. There, there's different challenges. I think what we have to be mindful of is there's not such a thing as like, this is the policy and let's, let's run this across the world. You really have to look at what the challenges within. And a lot of it is around the upskilling, reskilling. It's about redefining how we look at people. It's about redefining how we um, search for people and, and, and for candidates and people themselves. It's about reinventing themselves, right? Because the world is changing like suddenly it's not about sending a CV anymore I actually want everybody to have a chance in this new world and if you look at the 133 million new jobs that are being created according to the World Economic Forum report by 2023 which is like on our doorstep um, we are not ready 
the, the, the company, countries are not ready for that right now. So it is really a collaboration between the private sector, the public sector. We've been getting tremendous support from Microsoft, for example, where they are involved with government strategies and they're able to source uh, innovative startups like ourselves, like Searchy, which really work hand in hand with companies like Microsoft because they, they have the visibility on the bigger picture of what's happening, right? So it really is about a whole partnership approach and collaborating because who's important through all of this not either of us it's the people it's the population it's the jobs it's contributing to the GDP of the country right and as many people we can get working um, in things that with dignity right so when I talk about work I don't mean like putting certain people in low-level jobs and keeping them there I think equality economic equality gender diversity um, all of these things we can make such fascinating um, impacts on people if we put them the center of our strategy and then work out what's required around that and tailor it. Um, and this is where I think even as a tool, we're just a tool, right? Search is just a tool. We're just a tiny little blip of what, what needs to be done. But the powerful thing is really around the, the impact on humanity. I go back to that point again and again. It's like, why are we having people who are struggling to get jobs? And why, on one hand, have we got this struggle to fill jobs, which are empty? There should be no empty jobs in the world. There's a ton of people that are looking for jobs. The connection between the two is what's missing. And that really is about behavior and about how things have historically been. So I think it's very important to understand culturally what are the differences, what are the things. And I think the diversity of the Middle East is been a fascinating place to have experienced because if I didn't live here and I lived in the UK or the US I wouldn't see the world the way I do right I travel a lot to other parts of the world and I see I take pieces away from what we're doing and I really want to understand what are the challenges and when I step back I'm like wow the challenges may be different but they can be solved in a very similar way so you know, I, 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 I think that um, I agree with you. I think we have a wonderful opportunity because work is getting democratized. So in the past, you had um, gatekeepers, right? There were companies, there were jobs, there were people who uh, screened your CV. So it's not just about uh, not needing a resume because you can connect online. It's also about not needing to go through some of these gatekeepers. It's the ability to uh, redefine work as instead of a place you go to or a job, it's something you do. It's uh, what's my value? Who do I need to uh, work with to create this value? Who needs this value? How will they know I exist, right? And that is a different skill set, but there are also a lot of tools that are emerging out there that uh, allows us to find each other, uh, either to uh, create value together, or uh, I get something from you, maybe I give something to someone else that in the past, we, we would never have met. We, we couldn't do that. We had to go through gatekeepers. So this process of democratizing work um, from a, for a region that's, uh, you know, most of the people are uh, dispersed, right? And so, so we can rethink uh, who we connect with, who we can work with, and also who we can um, uh, contribute our value to and maybe even sell our you know, products and services uh, as regardless of where you are in the world language you speak you know you suddenly have a different way of thinking um, how you connect with work and how work finds you and um, I think that is fascinating from a diversity and from a geo perspective. I would like to see that uh, the diversity of the Middle East is really unique, uh, I think, in a global perspective also. But when we add the AI into this equation, we can get uh, a beautiful mix that uh, we say this, uh, how we digital literacy or human computer interface, or how do we uh, get acquainted with robots or AI to work side by side, we see more and more jobs. Uh, that uh, are changing and the human value is becoming much more crucial uh, to the employee and the employer because uh, you can, these, it's called the triple D, the dull, dirty and dangerous that technology can automate. So many things are dull today and uh, automation can replace it easily. And then I can do higher value work very easily and really bring myself uh, to work without the need to do these repetitive, simple tasks but it has also a different uh, aspect of it. And we can see it also in Israel. 
but also in the US, for example. Uh, people today, young people today, don't want to go to manufacturing because they know they can do higher value work. They don't want to do the labor. Even if we have problems in cafes and restaurants that people don't want to be the waiters or the dish carriers or the dishwashers because they can find higher value, uh, higher value work. And even in the US, they have more than 200,000 openings uh, in manufacturing and no one wants it uh, because they know they can find better. And this is also something that the, the value and the, the quality of work increases. And it, this increase in the demand or the lack of demand from people also drives automation further. Because if someone doesn't want to work or it's many someone's, then the sector, the industry will have to automate it. And it's uh, uh, maybe a vicious, but maybe not a vicious uh, that uh, circle that feeds itself. And we can see it around the world that the digital transformation is about the transformation, about the human aspect, and less about, it, uh, about the technology, how we can really create higher value of interactions. And you can see, as also it was mentioned here, the World Economic Forum, the skills of 2022, no skill is technical. It's critical uh, thinking, uh, emotional intelligence, and other human skills, that and less technical. Exactly. And there's also near it, it's not only the democratization of work, it's also the democratization of technology. It becomes much more simpler, much more abstract that everyone can use and leverage it for their lives. And can I just add to that point where you mentioned some of the jobs and people's expectations or uh, are changing, like in terms of in country? Um, one thing that I would like to add to that is there's always someone in the world that's dying for that job, right? Maybe the population that lives there doesn't want to do those jobs anymore. But if you looked outside of those borders, I'm sure there's someone living in poverty or not getting a chance um, who, who can get that uh, job if, if they knew about it, if the link was there. And I think one of my passions at Search really is by doing the video interview, by doing smart ways, which are not taking up time, not sending a CV, that person gets a chance to be evaluated on competencies, exactly what you raised. We have to look at 5.5 billion people are connected by smartphones these days, right? It's a huge number. More people have access, I believe, right, to phones than water, which is a really sad fact uh, in terms of from a human perspective. But also, let's look at how connected we are and how do we then take it to the next level then make sure that that vacancy or that job opening reaches that person sitting somewhere who then can be assessed um, by a machine, right, by, by the AI and for their competencies. And suddenly you've got those jobs filled, right? It is the first step to then uh, meeting the person and doing whatever you need to do. And I think the nonsense that exists these days, right? I, it's not good enough. It's not good enough that um, we are not getting gender di gender diversity or whether it's uh, um, more kind of diversity of, of all types of people, women not being in leadership roles. Um, enough, enough of the excuses, enough of like the fact that, oh, what should we do? Let's do a study for a year and pay millions. No, change the way you do things. Um, because if you don't change, and by that I don't mean spend tons in-house innovating, go and look for the solutions that can, and, and start experimenting because every company has different challenges. But what I hear time and time again, which was really what inspired me to go on my journey, was that oh, people can't find the right people, can't seem to develop the right people, can't seem to, yeah, I've just got gaps in my sales team. These are having an impact on business these days. Um, and the way uh, things have been going is just no longer acceptable. So I think companies need to take more responsibility to really look at what they're doing and not be confused by the results of, of, of why they're not getting what they should be getting, right? We really, I think as a community, as a global community, definitely here, we are all people that hopefully think differently, right? So let's look at what efforts we can make combined to really make an impact and, and leave some legacy, right? We're here for a few years. Let's try to make them the best that we can make them, not for ourselves, but for millions of people out there. And we need to think more like that to really fix some of these problems because they're not, they're not unfixable. Um, they can be fixed with what we have right now in the world, I believe. So you've headed into my next question. What is missing? What needs to change? So you already started talking about that. From my perspective, what needs to change is what we're seeing right here, this global coming together 
Um, I think really Enrique is the only person organizing such, bringing so many diverse people together like this to actively have this human engagement that even when you go to a huge conference, uh, you don't engage so deeply with people because there's so many distractions. You know, there's the booths, there's the gifts, there's the food, there's, but this engagement is, you know, we're all purely focused on this connection. We're listening what, to what people are saying. We're reacting to what people are saying. And, and this is really, really important. So what I feel is missing in, in, in huge companies, even companies with 500 or 1,000 people, is to have these systems in place where the CEO can come into a public area, flick on a switch, and have 1,000 people around the world in their global offices connected and having some uh, discussion, company discussion together. And I feel Microsoft has a, a big role in this. I feel these systems don't exist yet. Um, they may be a, sort of a patchwork of systems, but global teams need to be able to synchronize themselves. They need to be connected. Because we're living in such a shifting world, there's all issues of trust between offices. If you don't speak to someone for five minutes, they start thinking, oh my God, maybe they're closing this office, maybe they're firing us. People have all kinds of issues and they need this constant human connection, this reinforcement, this positive feeling, everything's good, everything's fine, Let's, we're doing this together, everyone's valuable, everyone matters, like Bob Chapman says. So um, we really need to get these new systems in place and sort of waste more time doing things like this on company time. That's what I feel. Yeah, just to add to that, I was watching a video last night of Kobe, right? Um, just random, came up on YouTube and I watched it. And a quote that he said was, get over yourself, right? Who, who is that? Toby? Kobe, Kobe, the uh, basketball player who sadly oh, broke. Okay. Yeah. He was being interviewed and he said, you know, what advice would you give? And he was like, get over yourself. This is not about you. This is, this is, this is about the people out there. Um, and if there was one thing that I would say is the, I love meeting people in person, right? I just got back from Silicon Valley. I travel a lot. And what I love is building those human relationships to really just learn and understand and listen and take that away and see if my business is on the right tracks, what can we do differently that I didn't know about or what connections are we building? And these aren't superficial things, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just being genuine and authentic in your purpose, right? We all have different things that we want to achieve and do beyond ourselves. So let's think there and then be in the same room, right? So I think the World Economic Forum, like they've selected us as one of the top 10 companies shaping the fourth industrial revolution. This was a huge, huge, like uh, for me, I, I love the fact that we were on the, in, invited into the same room as government leaders to sit there and discuss with Professor Schwab, like where he was saying, Governments are facing challenges, they're trying to look for solutions, and you guys are on the, you, you're doing it, right, in terms of a competency-based solution. So I think just being on the radar to know, right, it's hard for, this whole business was created because I couldn't find a solution to just be able to screen people faster. That's it. And if I found it, I'd be a happy paying customer by now, and I wouldn't even be uh, sitting here. Yeah, and I think you're also talking about... Uh, the difference between waiting for someone else to do, uh, to solve the problem, to connect yeah. you, or, or, and actually go out and do it. I think, uh, Josiah, to your comment, um, we've been in an organ, we've been in a work environment for too long where uh, the company would tell you, the company would teach you, they'd call you into a room and give you, you know, development, they'd hire you, they'd fire you. Um, and, and most of what happened to us was happening to us as, as a people who, in the workplace. And I think, Part of, of this change that we're going through is you can actually um, do things. And, and uh, Sahika even said, you know, uh, uh, I watched a YouTube video that happened to pop up, right? All these things we don't even know that we don't know, right? Going out and discovering things. And sometimes it is actually stumbling into information, into a conference, going to meet people without, you know, having a specific end in mind, and then discovering new things, and then things happen, right? So um, jumping in, getting involved, it's not just about waiting for someone to put in the processes, it's actually not waiting for someone to put in the processes. It's actually 
either not needing a process or just going out and creating it on your own. So tell so, me, we're talking about what's missing. What's missing? What needs to change? So what needs to change is maybe like the Kobe Bryant uh, quote, get over yourself, but getting over yourself, not for the community, for yourself. Because uh, <laughs> as uh, Tom Friedman went on a self-learning exploration to see what is going on and how is it uh, compared to the world, Everyone should do it. And this is the continuous learner to see that uh, if you want to be relevant, you need to be continuously moving and seeing the world and learning what is going on. Uh, a year and a half ago, or two years ago, uh, a book called The Age of Apathy uh, was uh, published. And it, it's very interesting to see also the election. We can see it everywhere, uh, what is going on in elections and the apathy of the people. But also you see because changes are so swift and fast. So people are also taking a step back and they should jump in back uh, to stay relevant and to, to swim against the current and really drive different learning. We can see it also, higher education is in a crisis. They know that they are um, not suited or not equipped uh, for this fourth industrial revolution. And you see this crisis around the world, also in Israel. You can see that in the last seven years, there is a continuous drop in college and university enrollments for uh, undergraduate degree. Uh, MBA school, business uh, masters of business administration schools are closing around the world because they are irrelevant and people are not using them as a platform. So something is going on and a change is really needed. And uh, we can see it uh, globally. And this is something that uh, an internal, let's call it a combustion engine for the people. Uh, they need to see how to rekindle themselves and start learning and be relevant continuously. Yeah, you know, I, I agree, Tor. I think that's part of, uh, of, can't of hear the you mindset can't read. change, can't right? Read. Yep. Okay, now we can. Okay, good. So so for too long, we've, um, we've been taught to sit there to a teacher, listen to a teacher, someone tells us, um, you know, what to do, then they test whether we've learned what they told us, right? So I think w there's a really big mindset change that needs to happen. And we talk about it in the education space, but it also talks about uh, all of us in the workplace, uh, because uh, what you're saying is there's all this stuff out there, go out and, and educate yourself and see what is possible, right? And to do that, we need to understand, um, probably mostly we need to give ourselves permission. And then some, some people are clearly passionate and they don't need anyone's permission. But, um, <laughs> but I think we need to start giving people permission to just take ownership and start driving. And um, I, w I was at the um, UN headquarters and I heard astronauts speak, right? There was a female astronaut, Yvonne, from NASA. And she was talking, and I think she gave a very good analogy. She's like, I used to always look up at the sky when I was a kid and look at the twinkly stars and dream and look at the moon and think one day I'd love to be out in space. And they played a video and I thought, wow, you know, the, they tell us sky's the limit, right? We get told as entrepreneurs, sky's the limit, like you're creating this. I watched that video. The rocket breaks through the earth and goes into this whole new space, right? The universe. And I'm like, sky's not the limit. Like, look at that. Like, look at this video, right? And it kind of made me think that there's something inside of me which I feel like has been unleashed because I was given the chance to experiment and innovate and, you know, do all of this and explore. And would I have been able to do this in a corporate culture? Probably not, right? I had to kind of go on my own journey. So I think I would encourage companies to try to be a bit more experimental. If you look at our teams, like they argue, they debate, they back up the reasons why they think they should do something. Everybody has a voice. And some of our breakthroughs have come by creating this environment accidentally right and it's happened so i would encourage more uh, initiatives right around um, uh, companies that can form like i know i'm seeing acceleration programs and things like that but let's let's open it up let's open up the minds let's say let's evaluate people's competencies and where can we plan them in for some of the jobs that we know are coming and let's start building these um, these pools of candidates now and let's show people also don't force yourself to fit into someone think that you're not you've got a beautiful personality someone culture come company culture is going to be so suited to you so, but how do you know how can you assess how do you even know where to start with that type of role because if you were to apply for it 
you wouldn't even get considered because you haven't got a track record, right? So I think we really need to redefine how we find people, how we assess people. And these are initiatives, I believe, around universities, right? If I look at universities, it's no longer about sitting in a careers office about what, what job do you want to go to and what do you want to study? It's about who are you? Who are you and what makes you light up? And let's tap into that and then see where we can align them with some of these jobs that are coming in um, so that we can truly be prepared from both sides. I like that you mentioned a female astronaut because really one of the biggest trends right now I think we're seeing is women on the rise everywhere, even in, our, in the Israeli army. <laughs> I, I was a sniper instructor and now women actually go out and are actually, you know, they're actually working with live uh, ammunition. <laughs> so uh, there's, it's everywhere in the world. Women are on the rise. They're taking leadership positions. They are leading people forward. They are the ones creating these amazing cultures and these companies. The feeling of warmth and love and people want to feel connected. And Tommy was speaking, of, I think, about the young people. And you were also saying okay, this feeling of people being able to fulfill themselves, reach their potential, have purpose. These are all coming from an environment that the HR people create, because I work with a lot of them. I, I'm not an HR person, but I see them because we do these hacking HR events in Israel. And all this warmth and love and all these good feelings come from women creating this amazing vibe inside the company. And that's a really critical issue nowadays. So we're getting into the last question, and I want you to please talk about what the optimal future model looks like. So I just I want to look back for a short while just uh, regarding women, as you said. Muhammad Yunus, he was the Prime Minister of Bangladesh years ago, and he understood that women is the power to unlock uh, the economy. And uh, he said uh, he got a Nobel Prize for economics on microfinancing, but he said a woman that needs 13 years of education and work changes the economy completely and directly uh, provides 4% increase for the GDP. And you can see it, by the way, uh, the Muhammad Yunus model is implemented all through the Middle East. The women, uh, the power of women for economy is a huge booster. Uh, and you can see it also, by the way, in our uh, neighbor to the south from Saudi Arabia. They are changing a lot of things, even if it's conservative. They understand that a change is needed and this, the change is uh, mandatory. And this, uh, the 2030 vision for Saudi Arabia is an amazing example of uh, this change that we can see here in the Middle East. Amazing. So the optimal future, the optimal future model, what does it look like? Let's dream big. I think it would be wonderful if we um, could figure out a way um, to make uh, collaboration and, and people to people work feel um, more natural in cyberspace, right? So basically today we still need to get on a plane and go somewhere to actually connect and meet, right? Um, the better the cloud and the tools become and allow us to have this confluence with multidimensional and more, more of a, a real feeling to it, the more we will be able to overcome time and space and languages to actually collaborate and co-create. Um, and I think uh, when we talk about uh, whether it's uh, minorities or, or you know, uh, women or, or other barriers to, to entry into what we used to call the standard workplace, um, the more the tools give us the ability to overcome the barriers, uh, the less we rely on gatekeepers, uh, whether it's companies or human resources or, or resumes, right? Um, the more this will become wonderful. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> so uh, looking forward, and uh, 2020 is already a year of science fiction of the movies that we, uh, we grew up on, but it's really science fact today. Everything is possible with technology. And looking forward, we, we can see that the change is real. And I want to just to take even the coronavirus crisis as an example. Every crisis, every global crisis that we have is an innovation driver. Uh, we saw it in 2008, the, the financial crisis. It drove many new uh, trends and technologies, even the digital nomads. We have, I think, like 4 million people today that are working from wherever they want. 
And we see also the coronavirus today that is changing how we work, that to enable remote work continuously, to drive new technologies to help us work remotely continuously. But it also has maybe a, a negative effect of this disengagement because you can see it also in and uh, we work, but now also you know, with communication work, that remote work is becoming a norm also because of commute problem, a lot of traffic jams globally. So I think we'll have an interim period for like the next, the coming decade that in, until 2030 that we'll have autonomous cars and things that maybe things might feel worse, but uh, then we'll have uh, maybe a, a, an an amazing leap of technology that will enable us the autonomous driving, AI that will take all the dull work and enable us really to be human in the work and, and uh, uh, enjoy life. And this work-life integration will change and the stress will go down, but, but it's going to have two phases, the interim phase and the long-term phase that will see the major effects of, uh, and the good aspects of the automation. So I would like to see a more inclusive society. Um, I would love to see us not leaving people out, right? Um, part of success for me really is getting to a place where uh, workplaces are far more diverse in their team mindsets and not just hiring clients. I like to open up the door to more people around the world that deserve a chance that have worked so hard um, to try to break through and change their lives. Uh, one job can change a whole generation and therefore, right, my dad, uh, were, I was born in a village with no electricity or heating hot water or anything. My granddad got a job, moved to the UK. My dad moved there as a teenager and thanks to that, my children, I want the world that they grow up in to be more accepting of who they are regardless of their race, gender um, or their uh, education background. I want them to be judged for who they really are and how much value they can add and be included in the companies that they deserve to make an impact in. And for us all to be in a, uh, to operate at a higher level, I want businesses to be more successful than they are now, just not from revenue, but from the, um, the, the, the uh, engagement and the satisfaction and the excitement that they have in their workplaces. I think that's kind of, what I'd love to see that in the future. The last thing I'd like us to talk about is our panel is about the state of the future of work in the Middle East. We are in the Middle East. Um, it's a very, very special region. It's a very complex, multifaceted, multidimensional region. All the eyes of the world are always here. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of conflict. They see a lot of negativity coming from here. And actually, we have everything in this region. We have tons of resources. We have tons of brain power. We have amazing humans. We have amazing food, amazing culture. Um, you know, there's something, there's just something special in the air over here. And really, I think if we fix the issues in this region, then this whole region could be heaven on earth and, and impact the rest of the world. So when we talk about this thing between social and business, we can't ignore the fact that you know, our countries in this region don't get along so well. So maybe let's take these last few minutes and think about how business, the business world, the companies like Microsoft, you know, how, how can the business world impact what's going on in the region? Uh, I think maybe we reframe that and say the people, right? So everything that is possible today um, and I go back to the democratization of work and our ability to connect um, regardless of barriers and regardless of gatekeepers. And we talk about that in the workplace and it's also true um, in other ways, right? Even pulling this, this panel together um, is, is enabling conversations that we, we normally wouldn't have. Um, so in the past, you needed global multinationals to actually do that. So I worked for Intel for almost 30 years. And so, you, you know, I met people from all over the world. But if you're not in that, in a global multinational, you don't get to do that. And in today's world, um, being proactive, getting, uh, for example, into a conference like this to actually talk beyond boundaries and, and times and place and even uh, the normal um, 
group of people you normally talk to on a given day in the workplace, right? So finding yourself outside of comfort zone and outside of what you're, what you're used to and what your um, routine brings you to, um, that's a wonderful opportunity for us. So I, I am definitely going to be stalking uh, Sahika here uh, from now on because I find her more fascinating and I wouldn't have met her uh, without knowing about or, or, you know, joining this panel. So thank you, Enrique. And on a normal day, we wouldn't be talking to someone like her. Honestly, the three of us are in Israel, Nirit, myself, and Tomer, and we wouldn't normally be talking to someone over there in that region. I mean, I don't. Maybe Tomer does a lot. Yeah, well, like I said, global multinationals build bridge the, those bridges, but I think we should open that up beyond global multinationals. Yeah, I agree. I think the uh, thing I would say is worry about the things that you can change and don't worry about the things that you can't change, right? So getting into the political side of the region, right? The, that's the Middle East. And whenever I travel to the US, people are always like, oh, you're from Dubai. Like, oh, women can work. Like, they're almost surprised. I'm like, you know, women are more empowered here like we're not riding around on camels like women are more empowered here than my friends that are living in the uk or the us right so i think this is about the change that you can create is really it's about not benchmarking um the western region and and, and putting all the middle east in one bucket and saying okay you're all similar no, in different countries and the middle east is probably the most diverse part of the world if you look at trying to make sense and i would not have figured it out if i didn't live here to just i couldn't actually describe the middle east uh, for all of the strength that it has and also the beauty in the diversity that it has. So there is opportunity and I wouldn't have created even search if I was living here maybe, right? Because I probably would have been more used to a normal level of comfort somewhere else. So I think you have to be exposed uh, to certain environments and I'm grateful for that. Um, what I will say is there's lots of funds that are coming here to the region. There are some ex excellent um, innovations that are happening. Um, we had an acquisition of Kareem, which was bought by Uber for $3.1 billion, I believe. So this has really put the Middle East on the map for U.S. funds now coming here looking to uh, create. So one thing I will say is in Silicon Valley, this ecosystem that they have is incredible. So if there's one learning that I will have is the the university, i.e. the next generation coming in, the students, and if you look at the private sector, you look at the startups, you look at the acquirers, you look at the funding, they've got it tight, right? And they've, they've it's had very it. similar in Israel. All oh, right, okay, again, you guys, yeah, there's, there's some amazing kind of success stories that have come out of these regions. And I think what I would love people to see beyond is the political situation because here there are uh, millions of people that are excited we've got a whole wave of younger generation coming in with a different mindset to the world that their parents lived in if i look at the country that my parents lived in in the uk it's pretty much the same still if i look at the world that was of the middle east to what it is it's, it's really um a totally different place so i'm i'm excited i think um different uh, ways of being are important because we're catering don't forget if you're a consumer-led product if you're catering to businesses you've got to understand the region that you're looking to serve um, and then benchmark globally to think um, is your business a we're global so for me um, I would not have been able to survive in the Middle East if I was coming in from the outside trying to sell my services or business here because I you have to cater to the cultural differences and this is if we travel around the world and we go on holiday, for example, we like going to different places, right? To experience different food, different uh, things that we wouldn't see at home. And let's take that view with, um, with uh, business as well. So. so I want to say a thing, just first of all, that my perspective is a Microsoft employee. So I'm working for Microsoft Israel. It's a subsidiary in Microsoft MIA, Middle East and Africa. And our headquarters is in Dubai. So most of the managers are sitting in Dubai and we, collaborate and work on a daily basis, meet frequently. And the colleagues are all over the Middle East. So we speak continuously and without regard to the politics or uh, the borders or anything. It's really uh, work Microsoft and looking forward to, to provide better technology to the region. And by the way, Microsoft on the other aspect provides now, for example, also in, in Israel and also Qatar, uh, the cloud technology is coming to this region and to provide this most advanced technology to the governments and to the economy to drive uh, better 
uh, efficiencies and productivity and new GDP engines. And on the, on the other hand, we have the AI for good. This is a, a program that Microsoft Satya, the CEO, released, I think, two years ago. And it's around $150 million fund to, pro, to create or to encourage AI implementation for good humanitarian action, for Earth, for sustainability. And most of the projects are Middle East and Africa oriented uh, because we have so much to do and so much to improve here. And this is something that I'm very happy to take part in this AI for Good program and to see how we can use this technology to really improve our environment, our health, and also the, the humanitarian crisis that is all around us. What I'm hearing from everything you're saying is you just sort of, the business world just rises about whatever's going on, there can be a war, like it doesn't matter. There's this, it's just more important. So you just rise above all the, whatever's going we had, on. We had numerous conflicts in the past years here around the Middle East and were continuous, seamlessly and continuously. And uh, uh, there are it's a lot of It's just proof people. that if it's really important to you to get along, like we were talking about from the beginning, the connection between business things and social things, if it's really important exactly. to you to get along, to accomplish something that you need to accomplish together, then you will get along and you will get along very well and <laughs> because it's important to us. And we just need to make it a priority also in, the, in this region also. That's how the, the business world has to impact the, uh, the, the governments. Um, one last thought from everyone. How do you feel now that we had this, you know, this coming together from different parts of the world a bit? How do you feel, how does it make you feel collaborating like this in this conference? Just a short, short feedback. I can't believe Enrique pulled this off. Like, it's <laughs> amazing. That, like, that's what I was saying to him before we connected to the live stream. It's but amazing. just the efficiency, right? I do a lot of web calls and sometimes people's internet connections or whatever else, you have challenges on a day by day basis. In one like, call and he makes a hundred at once. Yeah, like amazing. Well done. I think the uh, whole purpose of what he's doing, I love that he's trying to educate and open minds. And I think this is, when it comes to AI, it's about um, you and I, right? It's about the people, it's about understanding, it's about the education part. And a lot of the fear in people comes from the unknown and not understanding. So the more he can do these type of things, I think they're, they're invaluable learnings, especially from all of these industry experts from such a wide range of the world and from different sectors. I think you get a real um, pulse really on, on the world. So I think he's done an amazing job. I've, I've loved uh, being part of it. So thank you. I was traveling for quite a lot, so I wasn't able to respond to all of the emails, but um, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you for uh, including me. And I'm also looking at all the people who joined us in this session from all over the world. Some of you from the US, so I can't believe from a time zone perspective, you're up so late. Um, and around the region, right? So it's, it's fabulous to see um, what we can connect and accomplish. And, you know, uh, uh, we have Enrique to thank for setting the stage. And so um, my lesson always is um, uh, sometimes not waiting for someone else to set the stage for you. Um, I think this uh, the session, the Hacking HR concept started, I think, a year ago, at least uh, the face-to-face -face session in Tel Aviv was amazing also. And uh, the it's notion two years, I think. Ever... I think altogether it's two years. The two years I think it started so... in Tel Aviv then, but it's okay. altogether two years. But to have this concept as the Middle East, Europe, Asia, Africa, so we had numerous sessions uh, around the world and to see that, first of all, the change is everywhere and the change is now. And by the way, the access is a click away. So really like just <laughs> join in and uh, everything is click away uh, this time. Uh, learning, friends, connections, work, everything is a click away. And I think this is an amazing example for this uh, uh, notion that everything is accessible today. And I think Tom is really a living example of, he's the chief technology officer of Microsoft Israel, and he's talking about all these things like culture and human and emotional intelligence. He mentioned a lot of terms that I think maybe even five years ago, you wouldn't hear somebody in your position even mentioning in a, in a casual conversation that it just wasn't part of 
your, your vocabulary, I think, a, a few years back, especially not a typical uh, high-tech CEO in Israel. They, they just, you know, it was just all technology, technology, technology. So the world is really changing and we're improving and we're continuously learning and we're doing it together. So thank you everyone for an amazing session. Thank you Enrique thank you. and Yuri, Tomer, Saika. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. For thank, you. thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you everybody.